gasoline, diesel engines. And it's very hard to make it efficient on a vehicle because the, the way the engine is running changes all the time. As you and I drive, we speed up, we slow down, we accelerate. That makes it hard for the engine to stay efficient all the time, especially hard for the Stirling engine. The steam engines and Stirling engines of the 1800s soon had a new competitor to help power the machinery of the Industrial Revolution. And today, that new competitor is still with us. We don't have steam engines in our houses, but we do have lots of electric motors. Look around your house, it's loaded with them. Electric clocks, air conditioners, CD players, VCRs, fans, vacuum cleaners, blenders, and of course, who could forget, the electric toothbrush. They are all powered by electric motors. If without it, we wouldn't even be able to sit here and make this interview. It wouldn't be worth getting out of bed, unless you wanted to be back in the horse and buggy days. Unlike most engines, which use some kind of combustion to create heat, the electric motor is powered by an entirely different principle. It's based on the fact that when electricity flows through a wire, an electromagnetic field is created, which means you've temporarily turned that wire into a magnet. Turn the electricity off, it's not a magnet anymore. Hook it up the opposite way and it's north and south poles reverse. An electric motor does this over and over, using the magnetic force to create motion. What it does is it creates a magnetic field. And it actually drives it, just like Doug and I are doing. As the power is going through this field, this is a magnetic field and it's revolving around here. And it's sucking this around. Of course, electric motors need electricity. So their history begins with the earliest electrical experimenters. In 1824, Michael Faraday patented his direct current, or DC motor. In 1888, the eccentric genius Nikola Tesla patented his alternating current, or AC motor. Today we use both. If it runs on batteries, it's a DC motor. If it plugs into the wall, it's an AC motor. Tesla was the first one who introduced the concept of alternating current, where you would change the polarity back and forth as 60 times or 50 times a second as it was. And uh, Edison didn't believe in that. And Edison actually fired Tesla and he went to work for uh, George Westinghouse. Tesla was right. Alternating current could be transmitted over miles and miles. And there were significant limitations for direct current transmission distribution systems. George Westinghouse acquired the patents for Tesla's alternating current system. And in 1891, installed the world's first high-voltage AC transmission line in California, connecting San Antonio Canyon with Pomona and San Bernardino. In 1894, Westinghouse began manufacturing another one of Tesla's inventions, the AC motor. Early electric motors were used to power some of the very first cars, along with steam engines and internal combustion engines, which used an ignited fuel like gasoline to propel a piston up and down. I don't think anyone knew, uh, you know, at least for the first decade or more of the automobile's existence as, as to who was going to win out. Around 1912, the internal combustion engine finally did win, ironically because of the addition of an electric motor. It was called the starter. And it did just that, getting the pistons to start firing without throwing the drivers back out, or worse. Up until that time, you had to crank an engine to get it started. And it was not only difficult, but it was dangerous. It could take your, could really break bones in your arm. If one of those things jerked back on you, you could really hurt yourself. But with the electric starter, that changed the whole ball game and immediately signaled the demise of both the electric automobile and the steam-powered automobile. Like the hand crank, the starter's electric motor initiated the compression and combustion cycles necessary for the engine to run on its own. Some of the largest electric motors have been made for use in elevators. In 1933, Westinghouse built the world's fastest elevators for New York's Rockefeller Center. In 1972, Westinghouse installed the elevators in what was then the world's tallest building, the Sears Tower in Chicago. In the 1990s, the electric motor made an automotive comeback. When General Motors introduced the EV1, it was extremely lightweight with a strong, rigid frame and one of the most aerodynamic car bodies ever made. Some said it was built more like an airplane than a car. The highly advanced EV1 was a flop, 
and GM canceled production in 2000. As with all electric cars, its biggest problem was limited range between battery charges. If you're in a hurry to go someplace and you can only get 100 miles, have to stop eight hours to charge, I mean, you might as well have a covered wagon. I think it's unlikely that in the next 10, 20 years, electric vehicles will compete with standard cars. Battery technology is just not good enough, and these batteries are expensive once you take them up to the scale that you need to store enough energy to drive a vehicle. Now, if they get a bit smaller, and we're willing to have a limited range, it might be that electric vehicles will be interesting, because they really would have no emissions where the car is being driven. Electric cars may not pollute when they're driven, but there's still pollution where the electricity is generated to charge their batteries, since most of it comes from power stations that burn fossil fuels. Because electric vehicles require either batteries with limited range or overhead power lines they can hook onto, they've been more popular for public rather than private transportation. Cities like Los Angeles got their first electric trolley buses in the early 1900s, and some cities still have them. Virtually all subway systems and light rapid transit systems use electric motors. And just why do we call them electric motors when we call the other machines that power our lives engines? Well, that's a matter of debate. And it's a debate that can keep scientists and engineers amused for hours. They sometimes refer to it as the great engines versus motors debate. I don't think there's a clear answer. Technically, we use the word engine for a device that takes energy from some source, like fuel, and converts it into power that we can use to drive something. Engines versus motors. In my personal opinion, I think that an engine, when I think of engines, I think of heat engines. I'm a thermodynamicist. We talk about heat engines. There are many inconsistencies even within the industry with regard to nomenclature. The things that I would not would call motors as opposed to engines would be primarily things like electric motors. And how do you explain outboard motors which almost always have engines in them? Very good question. Uh, I never said we were consistent in how we use those words. In the automotive industry, a motor is an electrical machine, an engine is an internal combustion machine. Then how did Detroit get to be Motor City? <laughs> Another very good question. Up next, the internal combustion engine creates a new industry in Motown, and the world goes mad for motoring. The first electric motor-driven appliance produced in the United States was an electric pen invented by Thomas Edison. It punched through the paper as it wrote, creating a stencil from which copies could be made. Engines will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to engines on Modern Marvels. At rush hour in a city like Los Angeles, it's painfully obvious how the internal combustion engine changed the world. Next time you're caught in a mess like this, thank Etienne Lenoir. He developed the first internal combustion engine back in 1860. Like the very first steam engines, it was developed for pumping water out of coal mines. It was a big success, and about 5,000 of the engines were sold. Sixteen years later, in 1876, Nicholas Otto patented the first four-stroke version of the internal combustion engine. Otto's four-stroke system is used in nearly all of our cars today, so it's fitting that we call it the auto industry. We're still using that same four-stroke cycle, and roughly our arrangement, we've got a piston in a cylinder, we've got a connecting rod, and we've got a crank as our simple mechanism for converting the up-and-down piston motion to rotation of a drive shaft. That's, that's what he came up with, and we're still using that today, 150 years later. In 1892, Rudolf Diesel patented the diesel engine. Note the absence of a spark plug. It's similar to the regular internal combustion engine, except that it has no spark plugs. Air is sucked into the cylinder on the downstroke. Then it's compressed on the upstroke, which makes the air extremely hot. So hot that when oil is injected, the fuel-air mixture ignites. Mercedes-Benz made the first production diesel automobiles in the 1930s. Because of their brute power and ruggedness, diesel engines made by various manufacturers are widely used in large trucks and heavy equipment. As both 
gasoline and diesel engines evolved, they changed the way cities were built. They also changed the way wars were fought. In World War II, U.S. engine production reached an all-time high, as new engines made in Detroit powered the war effort. American auto manufacturers used their production machinery and know-how to build four million engines of all types and sizes for trucks, tanks, and aircraft. This mile-long factory outside of Dearborn, Michigan, cost the government $65 million to build. Under Henry Ford's management, it turned out 57,000 aircraft engines and 9,000 bombers. Ford's other plants produced a quarter of a million tanks and jeeps. Since we were relying on piston engine aircraft for our fighters and bombers, the automobile industry uh, converted its engine production facilities to producing engines for these applications and the new car production went down to very low numbers. Up until the 1950s, most engine development concentrated on making engines more powerful and cheaper to build. Then this appeared on the horizon. It's called smog. And because of it, engine technology had to accelerate in a different direction. Pollution control systems introduced by all auto manufacturers in the 60s and 70s reduced emissions. But they also sapped power, since they had the effect of reducing air intake. An engine that can't breathe freely produces less power. In the life of the internal combustion engine, most developments have been evolutionary. But one of them was revolutionary. German inventor Felix Wankel came up with a radically new and simple design for an internal combustion engine way back in 1924. But it wasn't until 1957 that he built the first truly functional Wankel rotary engine. It was a dramatic departure from the piston engine. And because it spun around instead of pumping up and down like pistons, the rotary engine dramatically reduced vibration. Many, many people over time have tried to think of a better geometry. There are some negatives to this simple piston connecting rod cylinder arrangement. Um, masses move up and down, and uh, that's uh, hard to prevent that causing vibration. But so far, with the one exception of the Wankel, nobody's invented a geometry that's got into real-world production. This uh, roughly triangular-shaped rotor sort of moves around inside a container, but not quite symmetrically. It's, it's off-center. And so as it rotates this triangular rotor, it creates sort of smaller volumes and larger volumes in a similar way to the piston moving up and down in a standard engine cylinder. I have a very uh, strong attachment to the rotary engine without any questions. <laughs> Kobe Kobayakawa, recently retired, was project director for Mazda's highly successful RX-7 rotary engine sports car. This is the only moving part of the rotary engine, and we don't have any uh, intake or exhaust valve or camshaft. Basically, we have only two moving parts to two rotors. In the case of a, a V6 engine, uh, the moving parts like a pistons and connecting rod and valves and camshaft maybe uh, 50 moving parts. In 2001, Mazda completed development of an all-new rotary engine model called the RX-8. It may look small, but the 255 horsepower engine is competitive with much larger piston engines. And it's still the only car engine in mass production that has no pistons. Kobe Kobayakawa talked to Felix Wankel just a few years before the inventor's death in 1988. I uh, have been admiring him so many years. His eye to look into Mazda lottery engine is always more like a father's eye looking at the children. <laughs> uh, he's, he's so nice and, and he was very, very pleased with the Mazda's you know, the effort and the result uh, about the lottery engine. Felix Wankel would be proud that the radical idea he came up with in 1924 spins on. Up next, tiny engines that make a dust mite look like a monster. It's called microtechnology. And it's the next small thing in engines and motors. Today's auto engines are twice as efficient as engines of 30 years ago. They get twice the power out of the same amount of fuel and put out half the amount of exhaust fumes. Engines will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to engines on Modern Marvels. Nineteen forty one. 